The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. I'm sure every single one of you at some point has seen these three lines. They're uh, the, uh, they go, this is the traditional setup sequence for a, or many open source projects that use the GNU auto tools set and configure to shell script, make, and make is, well, make. And considering that make is itself two thirds of this process, it's probably a very, very, very important part of this. And even for, even for smart projects, small and large, you will see, you'll see this sort of setup used. But Usually, the uh, make files there are automatically generated. Um, it's is because of some things I will discuss later, uh, but there are still plenty of reasons for you to write your own make files. So what am I going to talk about here? I'm going to go um, get into a little detail about what make is, some introductory, how to do variables, um, how to make make generic, some functions, a more complicated use, and oh boy and some useful information that is conveniently not on the bottom of the slides, the projector. Hmm. Okay, well that's on the bottom of my screen. So what is Make? Make is a tool for um, automating tasks for in which files need to be updated if some other files have been changed. The quintessential example of this is of course software. It, is, it was designed by, the original Make, not GNU Make, was designed by uh, Stuart Feldman in, 19, in 1977 for this purpose. And GNU Make was made by Richard Stallman and Ronald McGrath in 1987 and 1988 and is still maintained to this day. So, what do I mean when I say tasks that need to be? Uh, okay, well, well, if this would be seen better, there'd be two, there's two little circles on the bottom that are also blue. The idea is, is that you start out with, there were two circles on there saying D and E. If you update file, if you update the files, D and E, you need to update B, which in return you need to update A. If you update C, you would also need to update A, but since B is not any way related to C, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to rebuild B. Uh, dependencies. This is, all, this is all about dependency trees. Make, it's, when you run make, it builds an internal structure like this and builds and figures out what, it, what needs to be updated based on file timestamps, file update times. So, during that make is um, pretty common and there's a lot of ways to generate make files. There's, and there, there's in fact, a quite a number of things named make. Here's a bunch of them. Auto make is the uh, GNU make file generator as used with auto tools. Um, CMake is the cross, is Kitware's cross-platform make file generator, also generates Xcode project files and, and Microsoft Visual Studio files, should you need to do that. I think it's kind of nice sometimes. Uh, Gmake is GNU Make, what I'm going to be talking about here. iMake is the is a make file generator that was used in the old X, X projects. It has since been replaced by using auto tools, probably because everything else is using auto tools. Uh, NMake, depending on where you're from, is either old AT&T Unix Make or a Make variant for Microsoft Windows. Um, I have only seen one case of NMake ever used in Microsoft Windows. That was a very, very weird thing, and most people these days pretty sure use Visual Studio. Omake is an Objective Camel variant on Make. It uh, has its own little feature set, though it's kind of it kind of more resembles CMake or Scans, if you've ever used those tools. PMake is BSD Parallel Make. It's also Make. It's very similar to GNU Make, except it has a different feature set. Some of the it has some things that Make does not that GNU Make does not provide. But then again, make, GNU Make also provides some things that BSD Make does not provide. I have not gone too much into the internals of BSD Make, but there are, I've heard that the it is a little more um, nice with conditionals. I'll get I'll talk about that GNU Make later. And QMake is a uh, tool used by the Qt project to generate uh, Make files from a set of uh, C++ files for their sort of projects. And it's also very nice and simple to use. And so. The four, so like half of these are make file generators, so we don't care about them. They're gone. Boosh. 
bam, disappeared. Um, Omake is itself a strange entity. It kind of contains its, it, instead of having a bunch of target rules, as I specify later, it's more based on you have a set of files and glomp them together and say, make a C program out of this or make an OCaml program out of this. So we can ignore that. What we have left here are considered to be the true makes, gmake, mmake, pmake. But since you're either up with you have mmake, you're using a really old system or you're using Windows. And if you're using Windows, you're probably using Visual Studio. So goodbye. Um, between gmake and pmake, GNU make is significantly more common. The only time I've seen parallel make you, BSD parallel make used is on a BSD and some rare cases in which some guy liked P make better for some reason. I never really got it out of him. So we can get rid of that too. So all we're left now is the most common make in existence. Whenever someone says make, it's 99% of the time it's GNU make, it's, it's G make or GNU make. If you're on BSD, it actually is called G make. Every, on every other system it is just plain old make. Mac OS is, for example, is also plain old make. So there's some reasons why you might want to use make. It is awesome because it is simple and powerful. It is the equivalent of, it is, the, it is pretty much shell scripting with, that has knowledge of dependencies. And this also has the, this is all the benefits of being simple and powerful of shell scripting. However, it also has all of the non-benefits of shell scripting, like the first one, the literalness. If, well, make makes, when it makes own internal language, there are ways to uh, confuse it. So when I get to variable declarations later, you can have a variable, say, foo equals bar, and if you actually leave a space on the end of the line, it will include the space in the variable, which you may or may not want. It, if you accidentally do that and wonder why it's trying to resolve a file name with a space on the end of it, it's, it's going, to be, going to be confused for a little while. Enable your enable white, white space viewing mode in your favorite text editor. Um, it's also prone to inconsistency. If you, um, there are met, all programming languages suffer from this, suffer from the problem that if they're all programmed inconsistently, they're gonna be inconsistent. So, but make doesn't help this. In fact, it's very easy to write inconsistent make files. You can start writing implicit things that are picked up by other parts of the program, parts of the program, um, other parts of the make file that other developers might not know about without having to read a bunch of other make files that you have lying around. It's hard to debug. Oh, imagine shell scripting, except you can't tell it to um, fail if you don't have if you have undefined variables, or you can't get or you can't get all the internal stuff set by make without getting this humongous blob of memory stuff. It's rather messy. I can give you there's some tips to help with that, but it's mostly do it right the first time. Sorry. And make also has its own set of quirks. Um, a lot of the, there's a lot of implicit stuff that's going on. The literal part is also a quirk. There, and the only way to really learn these is to experience them for yourself. But the, about a lot of the quirks are also well documented. Make manual is a, is a very, very, very well documented. Make is very, very, very well documented. Even one of the advantages of the make manual, uh, if you look at it, it describes every single error that make itself will spit out and gives a reason why it happened. Most that cannot be given for, that, that advantage cannot be given to most software these days. Every single possible error make can give out is described. Of course, the reasons why it's happening, it'll say like, oh yeah, you have a colon on this line that you aren't supposed to have. But then you say, I don't have a colon on this line. Where did this colon come from? And that's usually, and that requires just, it helps you figure out where the problem is, and then you, can, then you can go figure out what it is yourself later. So now on to make 101. So um, how many people, so out of the people here, how many people, how um, software is made from source code? Okay. For the benefit of those who don't, the, it's traditionally done in two steps. There's a compiling stage and a linking stage. In the compiling stage, the source code is turned into binary. And in the linking stage, copies of the binary files are taken and combined into a library or an executable or whatever you're trying to make. So, and when you compile, each compilation step for each file is independent of each other file in a certain set of files. So if you have, so like I said, like the tree order, or if you have, uh, if you update B, B the tree on the node on its own, 
and you don't need to go and update the other the other target C that A depends on. It just you can only need to do the step the, comp the compilation step only when it's needed. If there's nothing there or hasn't been up or hasn't been updated since the file was changed. And this is why soft make is used for software a lot. So this is an example of a simple make file target that doesn't really do much. The uh, target is on the first character, first line. It starts in the first part of the line, so it's just a name without spaces. And you can have spaces, but that's uh, much, much, much more complicated. I can't really get into that. Um, and then you have a space separated list of dependencies after the fact. And these dependencies, and make will try to resolve these dependencies upon before it tries to do anything with target. And the, and there's a then there's a bunch of commands. See that space in front of there? See this space here? This is a tab. These are not eight spaces. A lot of people make this mistake. A lot of people make this mistake. If you, you're, a lot of editors do not know intelligently know to insert a tab here. Make will make will get angry at you and say you have put eight spaces here, not a tab. Fix it if you do that. And it, it's a. It's more, you can change it technically, but it's a convention, so please don't. And for emphasis, there it is, again, in large text. So here is a simple make file that I made for a, oh, wonderful, for a uh, small program I made, just a bit two file hello world program. And in this case, the first target in the file is all, it depends on hello. By convention, the first target in the make file is all. It doesn't have to be. It could be, it could, I just made hello at the, put the, put the hello thing at the top of the make file if I wanted to. But it's, it's all, it's considered a good convention. And hello in this case depends on two targets, hello.o and say.o, say hello.o, which are two, bi which are binary object files. Those in turn depend on their source files and the rules for each one of them are called GCC. There is also what you can't see there, which I will show you all in a, Ah, why'd you do that? So, here's the. <laughs> See that better? Fortunately, yeah, playing the projector. So here at the bottom, there is a rule to uh, clean. Ooh, that's nice. And this rule, and this rule just goes and removes the target, removes all of the stuff that make made. Um, this is off. What's different about this target is that this target doesn't actually generate a file name clean. If you type in make clean, you can type in make clean all you want, and it will keep on trying to clean over and over and over again, because the clean target is actually never made every time you go into make. It just well, the no clean file is written, so make won't see that it needs to update the clean target, so it just will try to call clean. So, can you see this? Is that better? Uh, one sec. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. If there's some cases the colors might still be hard to read, and I apologize for it. I can't really do much about it. So here's my make. Here's that make file I was looking at earlier. The so I'm. Oh, that's the projector. I can't do anything. Uh, it's shifted over to the side of the projector. Oh, you want it to be at the top of the screen? That? Okay. <laughs> so if I, so getting back to it, if I just type in make here, it will try to resolve the target all and it, or not. Apparently, I had a bunch of stuff up in there. So if I do make, it'll make all, which depends on those object files. It, these are it, it prints out all the commands it just executed to the file, all to the console, which can be helpful for figuring out what's going on. Same deal if I did 
clean. And notice how I can just do clean over, over, and over, and over. Unfortunately, it's running kind of running off the bottom of the terminal, so it's taking a while for it to show it up. But since clean, the clean file is never written, it's never going to be updated. I can also target other, I can also call hello directly. Fine. Call hello directly, and if I call it again, it will say hello is up to date. If I call just plain old make again, it will also say nothing to be done. It's all make, calling make itself is a pretty simple process, which is conveniently what I'm getting to next. So there are many ways to call make. These are, there are some, make is a bunch of command line flags, a bunch of all things you can throw at the command line. So plain old make will look for a file named make file or GNU make file. GNU make file first. And it will, uh, tr and it will try to find the first target and then make file and run make on it. Um, you can also specify a list of targets. The space separated list of targets, you can say, like I said, hello. You can also say, you can also have just built all objects, hello.o, and say dash hello.o. And it would have built them, those two objects, and not the, not the executable. You can also specify an arbitrary target file, and it's to be used instead of make file or GNU make file. It's maybe useful when your make file has a different name, or you need to, or you're calling make file in an executable make file. Oh, the first target in the file. Okay. No, tar no targets means first target in the file. No file means make file or GNU make file. And alternatively, you can set variables on the command, on the command line too. This is most useful when you start dealing with make dester. It is a very, very, very commonly used convention for package, for uh, package installation. So one more thing before I leave make 101. So, Make has a funky, there's comments are handled in a, in, sometimes in a strange way. So the first comment there is a, on the first line, the pound sign is on the first line of the first part of the line. It is the, is a make file comment. Make will not read anything on that line. It'll just skip the line. However, when you have a tab followed by the, followed by a pound sign, it will, make will still do stuff on that line. It will pass that line to the shell and the shell will say, ooh, that's a comment, I'll do nothing with it but make will still do some things with it. If when I get to make functions later, if you have functions in your, uh, in shell comments, it will still try to expand the comment, expand them in the comments, which you may not want. Okay, so variables. Here's the simplest way to make set a variable. You have a variable colon equals value. You do not need to quote the variable. It will read it until the, it will read until it finds the first unescaped new line. In this case, even in that case, if this was literally, it would be the, the variable foo would contain bar, parenthesis foo contains bar. But that's not, but I'm just uh, making an assumption there, just showing what it contains. Alternatively, but well, this assignment is done instantly. Is this variable foo contains a valuable bar right, ne bar right now. But then it can also append to the variable. So plus equals baz, foo now contains these bar space baz. The space is added on by the plus equals operator. It's you, a lot of make stuff handle is dealing with space separated lists or white space separated lists. So in this case, you just, there's a way, here's how, you, here's how you get access to a make variable. You put a dollar sign, a parenthesis, the variable name, and an M parenthesis, and it will pull out the string. Actually, it should, said, should be read bar baz. And notice how it's the parentheses there. If you do not do that, it will read it will read just, that will happen. So if you put a dollar sign at the beginning, it only, the dollar sign is only associated with the next character. So it'll look for a variable f, and then the rest of the string will just be, be kept there as OO, which is, in a lot of cases, what you do not want. So there are some cases in which it is what you want. I will show you one later. But it's this, but, to, but for um, also, it can be considered convention to put even single letter variables inside parentheses just for ease of reading it. You don't have to, but it's, it can be considered nice. I usually don't do it. Also, there's an option for a lazy assignment. You can, just make a, you can assign a variable a value, and then the first time you actually use that variable, the variable will be given that value. This is uh, useful for things that if you want to have a variable represent a particular value, say an operation on a file that isn't ready yet, you, and the file's not ready to the end of the make file, and you only need to access that variable at the end, and you don't want to just dump the command in a large print statement. You just say, you're gonna say print 
whatever, and it will call that and insert the string. It's it is a kind of can be kind of tricky, which is why most people will just stick to that. If you don't if you don't need to use delayed assignment, you probably shouldn't be. Sometimes it leads to funny things happening. Um, You can. Actually, you use them for non you use them for parameterized subroutines, too. Yeah. I'll get to that later. Um, Vincent? So, so, so the colon equals means that that, that variable is evaluated as soon as the next follows? As soon as the make file reads the, gets to that line in the file. Okay. Uh, it, will, it, will reads over the, it reads over and finds all make related stuff first inside the, that are inside targets. Like yeah, I don't, I don't know much about Pascal. Yeah, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like make make runs a bunch of preprocessing. It's a it's pretty much a, a shell preprocessor with some built-in extra magic. Yeah, magic. So in this case, we can make a lot of extra stuff uh, generic in the make file. You can make you can give the programming variable to put the source files in the list, the object files in the list, the compiler C flags in the list, and the compiler in the list. So what do we have? Cool, you can see all of it. Okay. Much better, right? So I have taken the program name and given, put the variable hello and assign it to the program name. Put all the sources into a list. It only, they will attempt to read the variable until it gets to a non-escape new line. First one's right here. This will be read in as a list. It's, this will be interpreted as a space within make, single space within make when you print it out. Doesn't make it will make it will just see usually sees a block of white space as a single space anyway, using probably using scanf or something. And same deal with the list of op output object files, then the compiler and the C flags. You can put variables anywhere. You can have all, all depends on a var all depends on the variable program hello. In this case, program hello depends on the object files here. You can you can put them anywhere. This is why make is considered to be very powerful. But then again, if you say accidentally put a colon in program name, you know, make will say, actually up here it will say, you have a random colon at the end of your line. Get rid of it. You would need to escape the, you need, you would need to escape the colon. Same deal in here. If you start including random, random junk in these commands, if you try, if you say evaluate a shell command as it determines what the compiler is, you're going to, and if it, and it fails, then make will, and if say returns nothing, then you'll then it'll just try to call. Then it'll just be blank, and it'll call dash o, which is not a command, and it will fail. So it's just a matter of a lot of it's figuring out. Is, a, is another one of the reasons why make is a bother to debug. Same deal with all the other fun targets. But wait, there's more. So a lot of that stuff you saw in there is repeating, is repetitive. You go on and saying like, I'm compiling hello.o, I'm calling to hello.o, depending on hello.c, I'm compiling hello.o from hello.c. That just seems to be like I'm repeating myself. I even have, well, yeah, that's the idea. It's simple. It's a, a common paradigm in programming. Why is that? So here's the problem. So. No, these targets are pretty much the same thing. They're just operating on different files. They're just saying all that's being done is placing, pretty much placing hello with say hello in every single one of these statements. Actually, I've never run that program. Let's run that program. Go, go, audience. You're my hero. <laughs> so. Let's take a let's take a let's take a look at this problem one step at a time. So let's say the hello.o and hello dot hello dot o and hello dot c, say hello dot o and say hello dot c. These are all right specified right here. So why can't we get it? Why can't we look at them? Well, you can. The solution is to use what are termed automatic variables. In this case is this case these these variables always point at variants of the uh, target or their dependencies, some sort of space separated list that can that can be substituted anywhere within a target. They are not valid outside of a target. They are they will be just empty. 
You know, alternatively, you can use delayed assignment to delayed assignment with these variables, and it will evaluate and it will evaluate them when it, when the moment it reaches the target. So in this case, this is the this is the hello dot o. This is this we translate the hello dot c. This say hello dot o. Uh, say hello dot c. And I can show you that this does the exact same thing. So. Same deal. Shall I just say that? So this is the only relevant sections that are changed. So the dollar, dollar sign carrots the first is the list of all the dependencies of the file, and dollar sign hat is the name of the first dependency. So it does the exact same thing. It prints out the exact same bunch of exact same text and produces the exact same program because it's the exact same program. You can blame me, blame me for that. It's like, ooh, let's be, ooh, make it more complicated. Let's have a whole, let's separate hello world into two files and have one of them make a command line argument just as it has a function that says print. Go me. So yeah, I just talked about, I just talked about this. You make file, all that variables are not really valid outside of make file targets. You can, you can set them using delay, you can, most often, use them using set them up using delayed assignment, and then get at them later within the within the within a make file target statement. So here's a bunch of them. Given a uh, target called derp, thank you, Vincent. Uh, that depends on four different other targets: foo, bar, baz, and foo. It will go and well, here's just a bunch of examples. So the dollar sign as the is the target name, which will be resolved to derp. The dollar sign uh, lesson sign will be set to the first dependency of the list. Sometimes if you like a source file, you can have all the other, you can have other steps of the other files be documents set, written down as, say, other targets that need to be prepared before the compiler is run, for example. It might be used for that. Uh, dollar sign, dollar sign caret is a, uh, just a list of all dependencies that make file has without duplicates. And then dollar sign plus says keeps them all has all the dependencies there with order preserved. This is, the make manual says that would be useful if you were dealing with shared libraries. I haven't really made any shared libraries with make files and mostly done execu uh, executables. So I will take their word for it on that. So now we get to the other problem. So you see that pretty much O.O files are made from .c files, right? And these are pretty, this is, this, this is the, these targets are the same thing. So come on, why can't we just recycle those? Well, here's another way. We do pattern matching. So instead of, so we make gives an option to use a percent sign in a targeting to represent a uh, pattern match. You can go and, in this case, it will try to match anything that ends in dot O and see if there's a dot C file that associates with it. And then it will generate internally a rule that says, for example, hello dot O depends on hello dot C. And you can do this, you can put the percent sign anywhere in the string. You just cannot have more than one of them, otherwise it will lead to a combinatorial explosion and make will um, not even bother to uh, <coughs> compile it for you. There are, there are, it says these have many, many, many uses. These, uh, you can make arbitrary compile statements with these and then don't have to worry about, um, write, don't have to worry about writing specific compile statements for each one of your files. Uh, there's a, you can also customize, the say, any variables within the uh, make file target, the make file target statement, or the rule to make it. I will um, discuss that in a moment. But there's another solution to this problem that you can do. Well, first I'll show you what it looks like. Hmm? That is the question. I didn't open it. Okay, so you're probably wondering why I commented that out. I will explain that. I will explain that shortly. <laughs> but this, once again, once again, it does the exact same thing. It does the exact same stuff. So 
as you probably just guessed, the next thing I'm going to do is show you what happens if you get rid of that statement. Well, turns out you can have solved this problem by just not even including a compile statement at all. So let's see that. No, why you fail me, Emax? Curse you. Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> Yes, and that is why Emacs is awesome. I can do what I want. Yep. <laughs> yes, it is. So, bam. It just knew I was compiling C files. You might ask yourself, self, how did make know I was compiling C files? That's because make has implicit rules, yeah, that, uh, already know how to handle certain common compilation tasks, like say it knows how to compile C .o files from C files, it knows how to compile from C++ files, it knows how to compile from Fortran files, it pretty much knows how to compile stuff from GC, anything that GCC knows how to do. There's a lot of, the make manual has a full list of them, but if the advantage of this is you can make something simple really quickly, should you want to. But if you wanted to say, customize it and say, Want to do something like that? You would have to use a, sub, a statement like this. What happens if there's multiple choices? In the same directory? Um, I'm. Oh, so what happens? So he so he just asked, uh, what happens if you have the two? If the patterns come up with two choices? Um, I honestly don't know. I've never tried it. Um, it's probably probably documented. I'm, a, I'm really sorry I had to say look at the manual, but the manual is truly the best resource on make. It'll do one, and then the make target will be up to date, and so it won't do the other. So it's going to probably yeah. depend upon what it's done first. Yeah. Yeah, or what needs to be updated, perhaps. I haven't, I haven't tried doing that. I wouldn't recommend trying to do that. You could you could also you could also explicitly say that the explicitly say what file you want, in addition to having the implicit pattern. You can say hello dot o depends on hello dot f instead of c, or for some reason. So where I was just at. So in this case, it's going to just say you can print out a little message too if you're compiling. This is they redefine they make a new rule. For example, the kernel has some has a rule that prints out, make rule of for compiling C files, it prints out just CC file name. That's, it's done entirely by having a custom compiling, custom rule to compile it. At least according to the source that I read. So, and so if you need to custom, so in the case of having lots of implicit targets like this, if you need to go say customize your compiler or your C flags depending on what target you're looking at, you can set no, you can set the variable to the, uh, you, can set, you can do something like this. So you can have the file, there's a colon there, you can't really see it, where the file depends on variable equals value. This will just be kept in, this, in this case, it will just mean that the variable C flags will equal O2 within that, within that statement. Or you can set it to nothing, because I've seen some random file that had to disable opti optimization when it compiled it for some reason. I don't know, just an example that came to mind. So another thing you probably just noticed is that another thing in the file is that there that this is these are also pretty much duplicates. All you're doing here is changing dot C to dot O. And you think to yourself, self, there's probably a way to do that. And indeed there is. But I have to go explain another I have to go into a completely different topic, which is I am talking I am my my slides predict what I'm gonna say. That's scary. Um, to now to go with um, functions, deal with what, what make has its own little text processing function set that you can use. It, they're pretty powerful and some, and in a lot of cases very useful. So here's how you call them. So you have so it's kind of like a variable, except you put the name of the function before and then just have a comma separated list of arguments. In some and like everything else, you can have you have to have the you. I would not recommend putting spaces between the commas because make may read them into the variables. 
And if you're doing something quoted with them in shell commands, it may not be happy with them later. So here's a first set of functions. Some ones deal with file names. You have one base name will strip off the file name, will strip off the extension from a file, list of files, the dot whatever at the end. The add suffix will add a particular suffix to the end of the file, give to a list of files. It, this is not actually affecting any files, it's just strings. It's stored internally within make. Um, and same pre prefix is the same thing as add suffix except the handles prefixes. There are a lot more of these described in the manual. These are the ones I've seen most commonly used. And in base name and add suffix, we have the solution to the previous to that previous problem. You can you can add shame on me. <laughs> so that's supposed to be suffix. You just have you have the list of sources, and then you can go op and you can go say add suffix dot o to the to the list of the base names of the source files. This is a paradigm I have seen used often in make files. It's simple, nice, and compact. It's also a command called shell, which returns a literal result of a shell command and stores it into a variable. You can, for example, get the value of the uh, system type, the, un the uh, Linux or Darwin or BSD or whatever it is you're using, and store it immediately. Sometimes you can evaluate them when needed. You can have, you can get, you can say, you need a compression ratio from a uh, compressed file at the end. So you can go and say, I want this variable to equal shell gzip.l, blah, 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 blah. And then you get all the way to this little statement at the end here. This is different because makefile does not consider, does not think, make does not think about quoting things. It doesn't really care. This is all passed to the shell immediately directly. So if you don't put two dollar signs here, make will think that it's uh, a variable called three. And which is, since it's probably going to be nothing, it's going to uh, be considered it's going to be returned blank and awk will um, whine at you when it runs. In addition, you could also do this with uh, back, emulate this with back ticks. There's also the all powerful for each. For each element, for each element in a list, output the value of text with variables set to the, cur to the current element in the list. This is in a way how you can redefine every single one of, uh, most of the file name functions using for each. For example, you can, I did it here too. Ah, go me. So add prefix foo dash, foo dash to the list is the same thing as for each f in list do foo dash f. And you probably, and it will, I believe it inserts a space on the end of, space on the end of it for each one. You can always do one yourself. I'm not entirely sure on that at the top of my head, but it's pretty easy to find out. So there's also, um, make has also options to support conditionals. You can do in equality testing or inequality testing. You can, you can support, what, you can also detect whether a variable is or is not defined, and I will show you a good example of that shortly. There's also uh, control functions. You can have make print out error messages within make as opposed to having target and target rules. Say you have an invalid condition or you haven't run your configure script yet. So error will um, print out message to the terminal and then immediately crash make, or not crash, stop make. I'll also give you a line of where it happened and the message is not need to be quoted like everything else in make. It just reads to the end of the parenthesis. Warn is not fatal, it just goes and prints out, says, we have failed, prints out, prints line, wherever the line is, message. And info just prints out the message. It's useful for saying variable, you've said variable to value, for example. Also, if you want to, you can make your own functions, as uh, was discussed earlier. You can have, but you need to use delayed assignment here, otherwise it will try to, if you, have delayed, if you do not use delayed assignment, it will resolve one and two to uh, nothing which will not do what you want. So in this case, you, to use them, you have to use the all-powerful call function. Call function name list of arguments. The list of arguments will be, will be in, viewed by the function as $1, $2, $3, $4, et cetera, until it runs out of, until it runs out of arguments. So I'm, sometime, I think make is, becomes unhappy when you uh, don't, when you give it too many arguments or too few arguments. I haven't tried it. 
but it's, once again, it's pretty easy to do yourself. And so this, what this will do, it will print out to the terminal when it reaches this, it will print out foo says bar. So now that we've gotten through, now that we've gotten through um, the basics of make, unfortunately there's a lot, there's a, a, make is a very complicated tool and there's a lot of uh, stuff that I'm not gonna be able to go over. I'm gonna show you a rather, a relatively uh, complicated use of make that is, um, that is actually commonly used. So um, believe it or not, um, the core of the, of the Debian packaging system is a make file. The uh, rules file within the Debian directory is in fact a make file. Usually in she being why is saying user bin make dash f. And this is, and it uses make to go set up, set up rules for going and building packages, compiling them, installing them to particular directories, cleaning them, patching them, unpatching them. All operations that are, all operations are handled by programs called from a make file. And I thought to myself, self, let's do that with a Slackware package. So I did. There are, so a, just a brief, brief aside again, the um, a tar, a Slackware package is simply a tarball with a, with a root, with a root that contains a bunch of directories that will be installed to the system. And the directory slash install is reserved by the package manager to for package descriptions and install scripts and other various things that the package manager reads. There aren't very many of them. Here it is. Obligatory copyright statement. Um, there's a bunch of variables being set. These will all be um, noted in the makefile. I'll be using them when I call them in makefile targets and rules later. Um, the current directory is set to um, the shell of shell PWD, the current directory, primary directory, sometimes it's considered to be called top. Okay, so. I didn't go over this, but there is what this dollar sign, this question mark equals does, it, it detects whether the variable has been defined. If the variable has not been defined, I will assign it this value. In this case, the, there's a command that determines the architecture, the Slackware package architecture for that system. Alternatively, I could have just used if in def arch, arch, equal, arch colon equals that value and then end if. That is the, that is the test for um, Test for conditionals in that case. Test for variable definitions. Here, I got a bunch of. This is this is block of a humongous block of if if then else. So if there are four ways to write if statements, you can look up look them up in the make manual. There, I chose this one because I looks more like C. So if the value of arch equals I forty six, you can have the space here. I don't know why. Um, it'll sign the variable slack sleeve flags with this string. I quoted it here because it's going to be used by the shell later. I didn't have to, I could just quote the variable when I encounter it in the program, rather I encounter it in the, uh, make, in the make rule. And same, and then else condition, if it's a, if you're running on a mainframe for some reason, then it'll set to dash 02 or 64 bit machine, or if it can't find anything else, just say else then they set it to just generic optimization. Set some more variables. The first target in the file is, of course, the almighty all. All depends on the uh, package, build, when just whether the package build succeeded or not. If it's just in the package is called temp package name version arch build.txe. All side container flavor packages are T, some letter Z extension on the end of it, because that's what Pat Volkerding liked. And you might be wondering, what is this at thing doing at the beginning of the line? What this will do is that this suppresses the printing of the command to the terminal. In this case, it will say echo, it worked twice. You don't want to say that twice to the console, it's kind of redundant, right? You can also use it to silence the co compiler command if you just want to say CC, for example. Here we have set up a bunch of package install directories. Um, let me just go and, yeah, it's really annoying. 
if, then we go extract the then we go extract the package to the temporary root. Uh, so you can set variables of anywhere within the file outside of tar outside of rules. Here we go and check permission, check file permissions. Now here's where the fun begins. Here's where we go and build it. It's just pretty much a shell script with everything split into tiny into into concise steps. Or in some cases, not so not so concise because this one is rather long. You know, it's only one command. Uh, one thing to note is that if you need to do an operation in another directory, you cannot do a global change directory. Period. Each one, each line is considered an independent shell command. It will like run, say, run system on each line by itself. So if you need to go change to another change to another directory to run a command, you need to do that first. So you can just do it. Do the standard shell and and to say if it succeeded, if it succeeded then if it succeeded then run command. And if make and if and if something fails in the make file, for example, it returns a non-zero exacode, it will uh, make will just give up immediately unless you tell it not to. You can read the manual and figure out how to do that. Here's where we here's where we call make to build and install the package. Um, you, recursive make is, is, off, is a rather common use of make. You can, so make often calls itself when dealing with different source directories within a hierarchy. It is how uh, GNU Auto Tools does it. You just have one make file per directory, then it goes and generates all the templates, and then it goes, it descends into each directory. And it does make in there. In some cases, this is, this is simple, but in, uh, it has some performance issues when, you have, when you're doing it lots and lots of times. It can bog down the system bog down make a little bit. There have been performance comparisons between CMake, which uses non-recursive generated make files versus make, which does, which is auto make, which does. And C tool, CMake was considered to be significantly faster. Well, maybe not significantly, but noticeably. And here we just have, here we have a generic post install step. In this case, I have just elected to make the post install step depend on three Steps that do not have an associated uh, a file. I just I call them .ts because they like timestamps. It was done at this point. You can go check the file uh, update time to figure that out. Or I could just I'll put the I'll put the command date to the file and then have a easier to read version of it. In this case, uh, post install depends on whether the install is completed and three operations that I have uh, chosen to do: um, strip binaries, um, compress man pages, and install documentation. So here they are. Where's my cursor? So this is, pre this is just a strip command just I stole from a Slack, a Slack or package build script. It's just a find, just a glorified find. And man pages goes and does another, does a, calls a shell for loop. Notice how I've got the backslashes on the end of the lines to indicate it's on the same line. And then same deal down there to find. And more writing files and bam, we're done. Bam, this is, and then we call make package. So let's test this out. I didn't clean it the last time I did it. This is a, or rather, just clean it. So the reason why I did it like this is that the way Slackware package build scripts often do is that it goes from the beginning to the end, and then if it breaks, say, in the build step towards the end, you have to go, it goes and wipes out everything at the beginning, and you have to start all over again from scratch. In this case, I have elected to make it possible to go and uh, just, if it, break, if it breaks in the middle of it, it will go and uh, you can go and restart it from where it was last at. You can update the step afterward and it will sometime, it will fix it. Sometimes it won't work, sometimes you'll have to clean it up and do it all over again, but you won't have to re-extract re all the stuff. Again, this is pretty much over, bam, done. So one thing you can't really see here, I'll just bring, I'll bring the line up here. This is in the, this is in the clean target. 
So this is just a command that goes and say if the file, if we have actually made the program before, call make disk clean. Just clean up all the other, all the package build stuff. And um, this dash at the beginning of the line here, yeah, some of you may not be able to see, indicates that if the command fails, continue anyway. It's direct enforcement of that. In this case, if the if configure.ts does not exist, it will return a command. It will return a bad uh, error code with a, indicating a failure, and we do not want that in this case. So I'm done with that. So as you can't see it, the header is useful information. Just some things that I have found useful from more using Make a lot. So when writing Make files, you may s I have a here's a Make file that I have written up. So we have, so we have a, in this case we have two programs that were compiled from two files and I've decided to make them generic so that the, so that the compiled executable.exe depends on the compiled file .o directly. As a, and don't even, we don't even mention hello.o and hello.c in this. It's all, comp, it's all derived from the program names. I've chosen .exe here because it's, um, because you can, you can have a pattern with nothing else on the line, except if you start calling make on, on unknown targets, it will try to resolve that pattern. It'll try to, if you try to say, if you make program foo and there is no foo.c, it'll say like, it's like I'm trying to compile foo.c, but foo.c doesn't, foo doesn't exist. So, what hap let's run this. Oh, right, sorry. Let's clean first, make. So a compiled, linked, compiled, linked, and you can't see the RM here, but I just deleted my two object files. What the heck just happened there? Unfor a make is trying to be smart. Make is saying, seeing that it, it is seeing that you have a chain of dependencies that are implicit. So it's saying like, oh yeah, the dot O, you're just making that from a dot C and if we don't need to keep that around because it's the only thing we're looking at here, so it just gets rid of it. It's trying to be, it's trying to be clean and nice. You can, there are ways to specify this, it sometimes can be hard to, sometimes if you encounter this, it can be hard to diagnose what's going on. Um, the best source for documentation of this is the make manual under a chain of, chains of implicit rules. Um, if I try to explain this, it, I would be talking for a good half hour. This is, a, this is an unfortunate side effect of, an unfortunate thing that make does. Sometimes it's desirable, sometimes it's not. It also, the documentation also describes ways to get around the little problem. Get around this if you do not. What if you want to preserve the auto files, for example? So, some tips on debugging make files: you can use control functions to deliberately. You can you put error anywhere in the file and have make stop in a certain state. Just say, like, I am stopping in the middle of a statement because I'm not sure whether this whether I set up this command, set up this rule right. And you can check the state of the command, state of the rule in the middle of it, which can have some which can have some benefits. Make dash n will uh, attempt to run the make command. Will attempt to make, but then it won't. But it doesn't actually do anything. It just says what it would do. Sometimes it doesn't this doesn't work, but it depending on how you set up your make file. But it can be useful for uh, it can be useful for figuring out what var say what variables are being set to what values at a particular time. Also, um, that's supposed to be two dashes. Um, make can uh, have a function as a command option that warns you if you have undefined variables lying around, which can be useful if you have, um, say, typos. So some tips. Be consistent. And this is a general rule in programming in general, but make it, if you start going into, an incons going into a loop of making your program, inc your make file inconsistent, you will get stuck in it forever, and it'll look worse than a Perl, pro uh, Perl program written by someone who likes to be, also be very concise, lots of, random dollar sign underscores and at sign underscores everywhere. And for, and for if you ever make a project that uses a make file directly, um, yep, for installing, always use Dester. It makes packager, packagers will love you if you do. If you don't, packagers will hate you. 
What they will hit you worse for is that if, if you use it, but then forget to put it in some other parts of your file. There's nothing worse than having a program that half installs to your package and half installs to your file system. I'm like, what? I wasted a good half hour of my life trying to debug that once. And the perfect response to that is, yeah. So some resources, the almighty manual, it is your friend. It is, some, it is one of the best manuals I've ever had the pleasure of reading or referencing. Um, you can also read other people's make files. Um, I will eventually be publishing these um, make files, make files to my personal website, which um, I can't really get to right now because you don't have really good internet access, don't really have much internet access. Um, there's also plenty of, like GNU Hello is also a good example. It's just also a simple program that does Hello World. Yeah. Yes, GNU, for, GNU folks in general abhor info files. But what he was saying was that you should all, that info files contain, the info files from make contain a lot more information than the man pages. Man pages are usually, can, usually, in, by, usually reserved by GNU for um, brief, how to, call this com how to call this command sort of thing. But most, most man pages for GNU software are Yeah, the, uh, for example, the man page on tar wasn't, is not automatically generated, it was made by Debian because enough people got into the, people started following bugs in Debian saying, like, tar has no man page. What, are we, what do we do? But that's pretty much it. So now question time. Yes, back. Yeah, that's some, um, there isn't really a good way of doing that. Sometimes you can just go and, you can go and like do like print, lots of print debugging to see where things are. You can, um, you can just print, say, you can go into the, you can go pipe it to like say, if you need to go write a command to a file and standard out at the same time, you can use T if, you, if you're saying, if you're say storing a uh, variable to a value value to a variable, you can t have it right to a file and then see what the value of the file is. It's, you have, you have to, it, it's, it requires you to be creative sometimes. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really give much of a good solution for that. How is it sometimes that? Oh, go, go on. So they are doing, they are making a function, as far as I can tell. So in my infinite wisdom, I have made a make file to compile my Emacs config, because I am crazy like that. They do something like that. They echo, the, they just do an echo, it's echo the CC file name and call the compiler, but they keep it silent. The, oh, put, put an at sign at the beginning of the line. So yeah. It, sil it silences the command. It does not make it, it's not abbreviated, it just makes it silent. So if you put a print in there, if you say print something and call this command, it will print that something, but it will never see, it, see, ever, never see the command called. Yes. Yes. So 
So he's asking the uh, asking whether um, how um, make determines how it updates files. Um, in this case, you're still it works on file update times. Whether the as in the goes and asks the it goes and does a stat in the file and say when was this file last updated, and then it does comparisons from there. So if you update the metadata on the file, then in the file itself, then it would pick it up. If you needed to, if, you, if the metadata was an external file, you would need to go make a rule that checks for whether the external file was updated, and then do then call information on the image, call the image update. Unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. So, I, I'll take. Oh, for my stuff? Yeah. I haven't posted it yet, but I. Uh, but I, I will. Uh, yeah, I'll put, I'll, I'll put everything up. But uh, yes, yes. If you, if you, uh, it is. That, if you can read that, ampasaltas at gmail.com. Yes, make, make, make. Yes, that is like, that is what I, yes, that is good. Yeah, I did it, but I messed some of this stuff up. Good job. You surprised. Did well. Uh, it's good. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. 
These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.